is coming. Welcome back, everybody, to Vassals of Kingsgrave for uh, the next episode of our linear reread through A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, our 93rd episode. We're getting very close to being caught up here and ready for the Winds of Winter. Uh, we just finished a uh, multi-part recap of Feast for Crows, um, what we think about the book in general there. And that means that we are done in the linear format with Feast of Crows from here on out. It is all dance, and uh, we will be figuring out if we're going to put the Winds of Winter chapters in or how, how we can slot those possibly, uh, the preview chapters towards the end of this we'll see um so our last episode we finished with uh ario one the watcher and from there we jump forward to let's see the events of this uh set of chapters take place from june 1st to the 14th of 300 my name is adam i'm also known as drown snow on the podcast of ice and fire forums and today i am joined by zach Hey, this is Alias in the forums. Glad to be back on the reread. Hannah? Shadow Baby on the forums. Matt? Farley on the forums. And Michael? Hey, Kawadegi on the forums. All right, everybody. How's, how's your uh, afternoon treating you? Everybody doing good? Yeah, I was just watching uh, Into the Spider-Verse again and just remarking on how amazing that movie is. So. Nice. I, I've seen that, that one. dozens so of good. times now. It's like one of my son's favorite movies, so he's just always playing it. Um, Your son and I are basically the same person. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've watched we we you know we've watched all of the classic like '90s Spider-Man cartoon series now, and we're watching the spectacular Spider-Man cartoon series, which I'd never seen. We went and saw uh, Far From Home twice in the theater. Like he's like Spider-Man is like his thing right now. So it's Legit. adorable. Yeah. Yep, I'm the proud papa. Uh, anyway, <laughs> let's uh, let's get moving on here. So we've got three chapters to cover today. Uh, the first one is uh, Tyrion 9 uh, from Dance of Dragons. These are all from Dance of Dragons. Uh, the second is uh, Griffin Reborn. It's John Connington's second chapter. And then we'll get to the first Cersei chapter of Dance and uh, catch up with her and see what's been going on. So our first chapter, Tyrion 9, and I believe... Is that you, Zach? It's me. That's all my right. chapter. I was just going to let you sweat through that. All right. Tyrion 9. So the chapter opens with Tyrion jousting against Penny as the cold dead eyes of Tywin and Joffrey mock him from beyond the grave, while the sailors of the Selesori Koran do the same. Tyrion does his best to play the part, but still no coins are thrown their way for their performance. The ship is becalmed, tempers are running high, and the stories of rum are running low. After the joust, Tyrion reveals to Jor that he knows the knight's plan to get back into Daenerys' good graces, Jorah rewards him with a crack on the head. Penny comes and tends to him and warns him that he should not act that way around big people. Eventually, the wind finds the ship again, but there's a storm chasing behind it. While the storm rages, Penny surprises Tyrion with a kiss that he does not want, and she does not really want either. As the widow widow promised, the stinky steward never reaches its destination. Instead, the ship is wrecked by the storm and left adrift, adrift for 19 days. On the 20th day, they spot a ship coming their direction, a ship carrying slavers. All right, so of course, we are continuing Tyrion's miserable journey through Essos, which has just gone from bad to worse. Uh, It's not the most significant chapter of the book by any means, but what are people's general thoughts on this one? A good editor would have cut it, Matt, you think? Yeah, I think (laughs) so. Oh my god, like the whole the, the, oh, god damn it. It's just like a waste of time. The only cool part of any of these chapters is Makoro. Yeah. It, that one that one scene of him at the end just in the storm with his arms stretched out praying to the storm. That's a very cool image. Uh for sure. And we'll see more of him later. But yeah, it's I I have that same feeling as you, Matt, reading this and it's that thing that I think you know, for some people, obviously, they love Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons, but that is a feeling that some of us have that kind of pervades these books is that there's a lot of content in them that feels like it just runs on too long. There are scenes that feel like they're just purely for the sake of continuity and they don't have that same kind of impact. You know, there's some series of chapters in the books as a whole where it's like every chapter after another is just like amazing one after the other and it feels like it's all building but this is one that's more you know it's more just to kind of establish where we are and it's continuing of course Tyrion's uh, you know his rapidly descending uh, 
emotional state. Uh, that's definitely what's going on mainly. That's the main thrust of of what's what we can think about with this chapter. Do we have any thoughts on just kind of where Tyrion's head is at at this point? Not kissing other dwarves. <laughs> yeah. Not great. No, it's not good. Well, well Penny's how old is Penny? She's fairly young, right? She's like teenager. Yeah, and that's something that Tyrion remarks on in the chapter that I think is notable, right? Is that he he thinks of he thinks of Penny as this person who's so innocent, right? That someone who's been kind of uncorrupted by the situation she's in, which I think is kind of an interesting thing for Tyrion to observe, right? Because, you know, Tyrion is being so hard on himself right now. He's really obviously down in the dumps at this point. He thinks his life is so awful, but he sees someone like Penny, who honestly has it a lot worse than him, right? Because she has the trifecta, right? She's not just a dwarf, but she's also, uh, you know, a person of the small folk. She's a commoner, and she's also a woman. So her, her life in this world is is not easy. And I, I wonder if eventually, it doesn't seem like it's happened now, but eventually Tyrion will recognize, like, God, I actually have it pretty good with everything that I've been through, and maybe I should, you know, pick myself up and stop right. being such a shithead. I, I don't think yeah, that'll happen for a lord, but I, I, I think though we, we do see a little bit of his like signs that maybe he's he's got hope coming in the future in this chapter, just with the penny stuff, because of the the development we get for her a little bit, just showing um, you know, like the way she thinks about the big people and like she's just basically afraid of the world just because that's you know her situation in life, unfortunately. Um, but Tyrion at least is still smart enough to try and you know protect the pig and the dog, and he doesn't really want to. He like you know he lies to her about the kiss, even though he's like I'm not into this. But he's like, oh, that was very nice, you know. So there there are still signs that you know he's not a complete lost cause at the moment. Yeah, but I, like I agree, Adam. But I feel like there it's just too blatant that she's supposed to be this foil, and we're supposed to start to feel like right. sympathy and you know. Uh, for her but like winds comes out it turns out you know she gets trampled by the horse and like the bow for marine does anyone right. get it? yeah like, that's it's the question these, right where yeah, is this going very forced onto right you. like yeah. we're supposed to care for this character because she's like trying to bring out Tyrion's humanity again and i i just don't i guess i didn't feel like it was gonna go anywhere or it has to i mean if like if if she dies off screen and Tyrion's upset i mean that's about the most i would expect but I mean, who knows? Yeah, and it, and in a, in a way, even if Tyrion learns nothing from this, that that's kind of an interesting progression of his arc. It's that kind of thing where, like, all these people enter Tyrion's life that are, like, trying to help him or just in some way trying to influence him in a positive way, and he's just, like, steadfastly battling all that back and refusing to change. I don't know. I think that's actually a pretty interesting uh, piece of his development as a character. But we'll see. I mean, I, I think it's very possible she actually does survive and she continues through the story. Um, so I, I'm not sure where that's going, but it, it'll be... Uh, you think she would follow him somewhere, potentially? Yeah, or? but potentially. He could, I mean, she could be his redemption. I don't, it could go that way. I don't I don't necessarily think it will, but I think it's on or the maybe table. maybe he just... So Penny sits the iron to throne. take her under his wing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She's the, <laughs> she's the queen. Coming soon. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, But they still we'll have see. to tilt for Cersei. Yes. <laughs> I, 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 Danny, Danny. Maybe both. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, it's uh I mean, I think I actually kind of think it's a good thing that, you know, I talked about the last time I was on one of these. I don't know if it was the last Tyrion chapter, but it's the one where they, they're talking to the widow uh, and he's so obsessed with Cersei in that one. And she's constantly thinking about how he's going to kill her. And I actually think it was a little better in this chapter. Like he's not thinking about Cersei really at all in this chapter. Instead, he's thinking about um, Shay and Tywin a lot. Which to me, like, I think he's really feeling, he's starting to feel some guilt over that, which I think is actually a good thing. Uh, that, that That's still something on his mind, and he's not moved past that entirely. Hands of gold. Yeah, so hopefully he'll come around on that as well. Um, I mean, there's not much more to this chapter, obviously. I thought it was funny, we actually got a returned reference to Tyrion's acrobatic skills uh, that that had come up early in the series. We got the mention of He's him cartwheeling across, there. yeah, cartwheeling across the tables of a uh, Casterly Rock. So that is not something that George cut. It's still in there. He actually was a <laughs> acrobatic master. <laughs> oh man, is this going to be like yeah. the shortest reread episode ever? Because could my, be my chapter takes two seconds. So. <laughs> I don't. I don't know about that. We'll see. We'll see about it that. It could be. Uh, yeah, I mean. It's, there's not a lot to this chapter. It's not. Oh, it's not yeah. terrible, but the last thing I wanted to check in on was how how are feel people feeling about Jorah 
at this point. Oh, yeah. He's a piece of shit. <laughs> he could just go away. <laughs> Jesus, Michael, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's basically all I have. I just think he's um, so humorless. And when Tyrion is, you know, explaining how the situation really is and all he can do is punch Tyrion, I'm just like, God. You, that you're a piece of best. shit. That's, that's really all I think. <laughs> the, Jorah's just like, he needs to be thrown off the boat at this point, but oh well. What is it? In the show, uh, Tyrion says, like, uh, long brooding silences and physical violence, the Mormont way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you would know that, but yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Jorah, he's, he's what he is, and he's obviously at, he's also kind of at his emotional down, down point here. I think it's going to get worse in the next chapter when they're both enslaved, of course, and he's just kind of dead inside, but <laughs> he's not in a good place, Jorah, and we'll see if he can crawl his way out of that. And if there's any kind of hope for him as a character moving forward. Yeah, but I really like that for him. Like, uh, I just always thought, like, at some point he should get enslaved because it's like, here's what you did, you little fucker. Yeah, everyone deserves to be enslaved. It's you know? life to teach them some humility, you know? <laughs> well, no, because he's. I agree. Like, <laughs> that's so there, there's that's a... why he's exiled. So. True, yes. He like, experienced it. Deserves, you that's know? true. That's a good point. And yeah, like, so Bina, Bina has a couple of notes here. One of them, and I'm sure many of you know that uh, some of the books were split into two volumes outside the U.S. So in her version of uh, A Dance with Dragons, it's two volumes, and this chapter is actually the last chapter of the first volume. So she's not sure if there's any like significance to that or just sort of kind of where the chapter's cut. Well, I don't know. It's not like any kind of ending or turn or anything, so... I don't know. I do you know why they did that? Do you know why they did the two volumes, you mean? Uh-huh. Money? I don't know. I, I think, think for the paperback, paperback just, is... Yeah, yeah, can't take the full, the full page length of A Dance with Dragons. It's too girthy. This is a great question. Like, we need to understand how books are made. Explain to me. Yeah. But Storm in, of Swords, in, in America... Obviously. Is paperback split? One volume. Is it Uh, anyway? Is it split? Because my Storm of Swords is one volume. No, but it's it's across it's across the seas. For some reason, they did this with I think Storm and Dance, and maybe versions of Feast. But I know I've seen Storm and Dance where they're two two different volumes, and I just assumed it had something to do with the publishing in Europe or something like something they're accustomed to. I don't really know because I've never seen that in any bookstore here. But yeah, I have to think part of it is that people are just daunted by reading like a a thousand page book. So they just cut it up. So it's not as. Yeah, yeah, that might might be what it is. I mean, I don't know if they're sold necessarily like together or separately. Is it it also a thousand pages long? Yeah, Feast is a little smaller, like God, I was going to say Feast could have been longer, but... Um... <laughs> Feast is only one Lord of the Rings. It's just one Lord of the Rings. Actually, it's like two. So, okay, here's my other question. Were they published at the same time, or did they have to wait? No, no, no. It was, it was published, like, when the, like, when the book came out, you know, it, whenever they released this edition, there, there were just two volumes to it. It wasn't like... You well, had you had to, wait to buy for the other volume. Separately. I'm not sure about that. I, I don't know. I don't know if both the volumes came together. I mean, I would kind of think that, or if you, you had to pay extra. I'm not sure. I just know I've seen a lot of people that have like the two volumes of, of mm. Storm and of Dance. So, anyway, that's a you know. I'm sure someone listening to this is screaming right now, <laughs> with with the obvious answer that we don't know. Um, so, book yeah. owner or two, <laughs> Greg, Greg for sure. Uh, <laughs> Greg, just go back five minutes ago and skip all this. It's fine. Yeah. So, um, Mina also mentions, uh, we've sort of covered this a little bit, that it's weird that Tyrion re- remains, retains his humanity uh, with Penny and kind of being a little protective of her, but doesn't really have any remorse over killing Shay or Tywin. So, um, I, I think he, he maybe has a little bit of remorse over that, but I don't know. It's It's such a complicated decision because his dad kind of deserves it and i mean we'll we'll hear in the next chapter the way tywin operated and of course we know the way tywin uh treated him shay 
And that's just Tyrion was punishing himself for that more than anything, for being an idiot. Uh, anyway. I think so, in the past, um, Tyrion has always demonstrated this very definite black and white idea of who is worthy of his pity, depending on people that have wronged him and people that have not. Like when he, I remember he gazes at Grandmaster Pycelle after he puts him in the black cells and he's like, yeah, take that, you piece of shit. And I've always felt kind of sorry for Pycelle, but not Tyrion. Huh. Yeah. He, he's definitely a vengeful little asshole. I mean, he does not, uh, does not let shit go. But yeah, Shay, Tywin, they've all wronged him, whereas Penny hasn't specifically wronged him as of yet. <laughs> There's still time. <laughs> Oh, goodness. All right, we ready to move on? I'm just thinking about how Penny's going to betray him now. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone knows the prophecy. The, the bad when they Penny. split the book up, it, they gave it two different names. I'm sorry, I'm tripping on that. <laughs> Dreams and Dust. Yeah. yeah, it's called Dreams and Dust and After the Feast. That's yeah. weird. Are the two volumes? Yeah, because most of the back half is stuff that's um, after Feast, and actually, literally, it is because in the linear timeline, we just finished Feast in the last reread. Um, interesting. So that, it, yeah, it, that it lines really up. is interesting. It still doesn't say why, though. I feel like we should call this the After the Feast reread. Now, <laughs> we probably should. Um, Speaking of, after things, after Tyrion 9, we jump a nice. whole 20 chapters and 120 Smooth. pages ahead to The Griffin Reborn, which is John <clears throat> Connington's second chapter. And this guy moves quick. Uh, this takes place, this is actually about two weeks after the uh, Tyrion chapter we just read. And that is going to be Varley with the chapter he was extremely excited to cover. I really was, guys, and I kind of misremembered this entire thing because I thought there was a lot more backstory on the Conningtons. I thought there was a lot more, like, this is where we find out, like, John Connington was totally gay for Rhaegar, and I didn't get that this time. I don't know what happened. So I guess presumably the storm that wrecked Tyrion also scattered their fleet, and the Golden Company's fleet, and they're all over the place. And within a, in a couple of days, they've already taken over three minor castles, including the Griffin's Roost, the ancestral home of John Connington. Uh, basically, they take it with very little resistance. They set up shop. He kind of just takes over the place they're making plans he goes up to uh his tower spire where he remembers looking over his lands with his father and then later on with Rhaegar and has like a conversation with him and then you know uh thinks that uh as Bina <laughs> as Bina wrote down uh he says to himself I rose too high loved too hard dared too much I tried to grasp a star and overreached and fell and as she asks, like, who talks to themselves like that, I have no idea. But is that supposed to be the only evidence that we have that John really loved Rhaegar in a sexual and not martial or, you know, um, as a brother in arms kind of a way? I don't know. Um, so Harry Strickland's still a pussy and is bitching about elephants. And at the very end, um, <laughs> Fagon comes up with uh, Sir Duck and he says uh, he wants to lead the assault on Storm's End. And that's it. <laughs> um, with this chapter, was anyone else when they first read it like, holy shit, that was easy? <laughs> I just yeah. I felt like. It came really quick, them landing after, like, so long of not anyone getting anywhere. It was just like, whoa, they actually made it. Yeah, I like the dude that threw cold oil on them. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. How awkward when, when it's just like, oh, that did nothing. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> the cauldron caused more damage. I love it. That was good. So greasy. It was like a trombone slide. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's something kind of just funny about how efficient the Golden Company is, just like ruthlessly taking over this castle and just catching them unawares. Although, you know, Except... it, th there are some problems. They don't have elephants. <laughs> Their ships they are all over the place. No, which elephants, is a big problem. Which is a huge deal. Harry and, yeah, is pissed. Their people are just getting dropped off everywhere, which is actually 
kind of low key a great strategy. It turns out. <laughs> Because yeah, he's like, well, he's like, what if people? So what if people hear about them landing? They'll just hear about Raiders landing. Yeah. They're kind of like, we probably should have done this in the first place. And all I kept on thinking was, uh, I think they they mentioned like the Crow's Nest or something, which is the uh, the castle of House Morgan. And wasn't Morgan the guy with a pet monkey in Renly's army? That's Mark Mullendore. God damn it! So I was. Hey, you're almost there. <laughs> All these M's. There's, M, there's M's involved, yeah. And and way to way to remember for both of you. Holy crap! I've I've completely forgot about a pet monkey. I didn't even know there was a monkey in the whole series. <laughs> I'm blown away. I I agree. Wait wait until we get Bravo. to the Victorian's uh, chapter where the monkeys throwing their shit. <laughs> and oh, Victorian yeah. hates the monkeys, which is my favorite <laughs> detail ever. <laughs> He hates everything, though. Let's he thinks they're laughing at him. But sorry, this isn't related to the chapter. Um, <laughs> so the Does anyone have things... anything to say about the chapter? Because I could talk about monkeys instead. Yeah, so, I mean, we talk about uh, what Red, Red Ron at Connington, and we realize that, like, the Conningtons actually had a significant, you know, land holding. They were for, like, a long time. But 50 they... generations, which I calculated out to be 1,500 years or so. That's a good stretch of uh, land ownership. Crazy. And they have a, they have a huge castle still, but they're just like, you know, the knight of the castle, which is kind of like, uh, okay. <laughs> um, usually, I don't know. Usually, when you dethrone like a powerful lord like that, you give their castle to someone else, and maybe you give them a smaller castle. But I don't know. Maybe no no one wanted Griffin's roost, or it, it doesn't matter. But it's just uh, it's interesting to to hear you know what kind of person this was, you know, and it makes sense that how close he was to. Um, to the prince and all that kind of, you know, makes a little more sense. But then he does mention his failure to capture Robert and how Which it I, had been Tywin. He, uh, Tywin would have just burned everything to the ground and killed everyone and been like, all right, we're good. Like, did I misremember? Didn't they go over in more detail in one of his chapters, like the Battle of the Bells and um, the Bells, yeah. and his relationship with Rhaegar? I think because this I, is the one. That's where you're more getting the he's totally gay for him. No, so, I think it's all in this chapter. Yeah, this is the first time it comes yeah, up. Yeah, with the him. stuff with Rhaegar, I don't think you ever get a ton of that. Like we've extrapolated a lot, but okay. I so mean, this is then, his, this is his only POV, correct? Or am I way off? He has no. One he's this is his second chapter. Like, oh, okay. He's always talking about the fucking bells in that one chapter, and I—that's what I thought that was about. Right. It's 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 actually explained in this one what what he's talking about. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, I misremembered. I thought there was a lot more juicy stuff here, but you know, I don't think John is sexually in love with Rhaegar. I think it's a commander kind of subservient. Well, that would be really weird because he's dead. We discussed this in the Gaze Night Out uh, podcast that he, yeah, is absolutely not prescient and aware of his sexuality. And so this is something that's much more homosocial and romantic rather than overtly hmm. sexual. Huh. Like, see, I'm, I'm getting like that. a Sam Frodo kind of love vibe here. Like, But I'm your John. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, who who refers to um, their prince as oh my silver prince like like <laughs> Sansa would? Well, Sansa would. But... And additionally, in this chapter, he reminisces on the wedding with Elia, and John was pissed off, and he's like, yeah, Elia she was not good enough for him. him. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah. like, <laughs> There's something going on. I, I think it would be a v- very short-sighted to not think that, that, at the very least, it was a very strong, very strong connection, and the, just the fact that he ruminates about it constantly. Yeah, I mean, it's very much a thing. And and his little remark about Elliot not being good enough, I really expected. I guess, and again, this is just me misremembering the chapter that maybe he would have brought up something about uh, Lyanna in that business maybe like she was more worthy and that's why you know Rhaegar and we get a little insight into that whole episode but no we didn't well clearly well, no we woman do, is good actually. enough for Rhaegar <laughs> yeah the interesting thing about that too is it feels very one sided to me you know it feels like you know John Khan is all in all these kind of ways hoping that he'll be recognized by Rhaegar but it, at this point it's not clear that ever happens so 
that might be part of the resentment well, there. Well, Rhaegar is just kind of an asshole that doesn't yeah. communicate with anyone. Now, that's the interesting thing I wanted to talk about, right? You know, this is a thing that comes up a lot, right? It's like, what is the deal with Rhaegar? Is he a good guy? Is he a shitty guy? And I think here we get some more ammunition for the fact that he is kind of just like a weird dude living in his own world and not really caring about anyone else, including people like Elia and Lyanna. It seems like he's kind of just using them as broodmares because he has this prophecy right. he needs to fulfill. We see here mentioned that John Khan says that um, that uh, Elia could never you know, bear a child again after, uh, after Aegon, so he just moves on to someone else who could bear a child and complete his prophecy. That seems I, to be the motive. I think that Rhaegar had good motives for certain things. Like, he wants the realm to be stable, he wants there to be peace, he wants to save the world and all that. But he's, he, he's kind of like your... I don't know, you're like, you know, like on the spectrum type of guy that just sort of is not, he doesn't really understand social cues so much, maybe. Yeah, like I feel the same. He, his father's burning people and he's like, right, right, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that later. I'm kind of in the in the middle of something, you know. He like runs off with Diana <laughs> and it's like starts a war and he's like, well, whatever, I'm, I'm busy. Like when I come back, it'll be fine. Like, you know, <laughs> it's like, it reminds me of, um, uh, the way they portrayed like Mark Zuckerberg in like the Facebook movie and just being like, kind of like a, a <laughs> you know, like, a, like, like everything I do time. is destined. Yeah. Like you're wasting my time. Like not necessarily like I want to do bad things or anything like that, but like, here's what I'm doing. Get on board. And if you don't understand it, well, what the fuck's wrong with you? You know, I think of Rhaegar the same way. I think, uh, I think he just, yeah, he just doesn't have that kind of consciousness of, of social cues and social situations, which doesn't make him a bad guy. It just makes him the you know the kind of person he is, and unfortunately, it means that he does end up using people, seemingly like John Con, uh, like uh, Elia, and like Liana, and you know they may have this love for him, but it doesn't. I don't necessarily think it, it's back, and maybe it is love in his own weird way, but right because that kind of reminds me of how Renly is too with well, people yeah, like Renly. Like well, Renly gets people like Renly knows how to work people. And yeah, I think he's, that the, the he's odd part, part charismatic, but I think he's really selfish and kind of like right, right, shallow. You know, I think that the odd part about Rhaegar is that he is a, a very charismatic person in a way, because, depending on who you talk to, obviously. But because he's very attractive and he's very talented, and the stuff he does like inspires people, I guess you'd say. So like he understands, or maybe he's just not even doing it intentionally. But, Even Ned and Robert don't have like bad things to say about him outside the right. whole show. Yeah. Right. So it's like, like there's, there's definitely a charisma to him, but there's not like a social awareness. There's not. He's like, not a player know, of his, the his game. His social IQ is low. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's just you know, emotional like, the intelligence. Targaryen, yeah. uh, exceptionalism that is like Don. It's like the free range of that whole family to do like, you know, whatever the fuck they want. He's charismatic in, like, the most purest sense where he has, like, an aura about him. Like, there's actually just something magnetic about him that you can't explain. It's not anything he does specifically, I don't think, but there's just... That's the interpretation I get, is that it, there's just right. something about he, him that the, draws people. He's not, like, the Tony Robbins, like, rah-rah, like, guy that's out there, like, you know, you know um, engendering that feeling in people through speeches and through, like, well-practiced, you know, rhetoric or anything like that. He's just sort of the guy that carries it. And there's something even about the distance that he probably shows with people that even makes him more magnetic, I think. I think that's definitely a thing. I do want to talk, you know, I was mentioning this a little bit in the chat. There are like a handful of characters where I do think both, you know, in terms of us as readers of the story and also, you know, characters in the text, I think there are some characters where their tale kind of grows in the telling. And of course, um, Rhaegar is one of them. And it's interesting that a lot of these characters are connected. Like characters like John Con, who, you know, you mentioned, Varley, you thought of this chapter much more highly than, than you actually experienced when you actually went back and read it. And there's this like feeling that like John Con is like this very significant, important figure, but really he, he seems like just a guy, kind of a, you know, weird guy when you read the chapter. And there's him, there's Rhaegar, there's people like Arthur Dane, of course, in the Tower of the Joy thing that we kind of mythologize as this great figure, this great warrior. You know, if we were doing like a power ranking of, of knights, he'd probably come up pretty high, even though we've never seen him fight, really. Um, and of course, Lyanna, as well as one of those people. And Ashara Dane, you know, all these people that we really don't know anything about, but really people really love in the fandom, don't you think? I think that's deliberate romanticism on George's mm. part, where all exactly. the dead characters are remembered as better than they were. 
Like What's when Robert funny, sees though, Liana's statue and it's like, oh, she was more beautiful than that. And yeah. like, yeah, of course, Robert. The funny thing is that we can be conscious of that as readers, that that is the tactic George is using. But we still fall into those same traps very frequently. We still think of Liana, you know, mm. in that way. It's it's strange how it works that well. George has sucked us in. Yeah, There's we no want we bitch. want to believe some of these things. Obviously, and I mean the the writing is very effective. Um, yeah, there's this sort of awe yeah. appreciation I think we have that that is mirrored by characters that you know remark on these these great noble figures when the realm used to be, you know, a noble place before it fell into ruin. But really, what it is is that we just it's just mythologizing the past, right? It was it was always the way it is. Now we just have this lens into the current reality that just feels more mundane because that's what where we're at, and that's why I think this chapter is interesting, right? Because John Con kind of is a, a part of that mythical past. But he's the only one who kind of made it out of that. You know, you could also say people like Ned, but he made it out of it. And that's why he seems so mundane when you actually go and read what he's doing now. He's like not as interesting as like he's made out to be in all these stories. Make the realm so great again. How long do you think he lasts? How, how long do you think he lasts into uh, into winter? I think he's going down when King's Landing blows up. That's my suspicion. You don't think his grayscale is going to do anything? Because it's like the grayscale doth protest too much. Is, oh, is serving yeah. to accelerate his actions, where he's always thinking in this chapter, fuck you, homeless Harry Strickland, we need to move and do stuff. I mean, he'd think that anyway, but it's 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 making him think, you know, oh, I should have burnt down. Right, the, it, the it might make sets. him make mistakes or hasty alliances or something. And I feel like it's more of a narrative device than like what's going to actually be a huge problem for him. I don't think he'll live long enough for the grayscale to really be too significant. I, I'm kind of more, I, I, I don't know if it's going to be like the full scale epidemic thing that people theorize, but I'm kind of more with Varley that I feel like there, there's so much mention of grayscale. It has to be like a significant part of what happens in some degree. I don't know. I feel like it has to have some impact. I'm undecided if uh, John Connington will be the main vector or if Shireen will be the main uh, vector. Reactivating that. Yeah. Shireen is fine, guys. She's had That's it not for, what Val thinks. <laughs> Wildlings don't know anything. It is known. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, but isn't it like if you do survive that long, then it's... It's dormant. Yeah. Yeah, like right. Chicken well, could there's, come back. Yeah, there's a lot of... Con- conflicting answers about grayscale in the books but like the narrative around shireen seems to be sort of like the chicken pox thing like oh you had it as a kid and like you know you're kind of fine but you get it as an adult you're fucked sort of thing so she'll she'll get shingles yeah it's already in you i've seen the posters Oh man! All right, I got a couple weird ones on this chapter. Uh, is anyone else suspicious of a, a Duckfield, the the Kingsguard guy? It's, I feel like it's the same kind of <laughs> Doc protest too much thing. Like, why is he getting so much screen time? I'm kind of suspicious that something's going to happen with that dude. I think he's going to go down swinging, trying to protect uh, Fagon there with the storming of Storm's End, and uh, I don't know. I'm not too suspicious of him. I, I I'm, ke- like I'm, him. I'm keeping an eye on Duckfield. Is all I'm saying. I mean, Tyrion liked him. <laughs> well, so. first of all, that's obviously like a bullshit name. <laughs> like, so, I don't oh, yeah. think that's it's definitely an alias. Yeah. It's not really his name. Oh yeah, he's undercover for sure. In a field where oh, he was I'm being definitely, knighted. That's yeah. where it comes I'm, from. <laughs> yes, totally. I'm with you. I I think he's shifty. <laughs> Keep an eye out for Duck. Well, he's all a right. little too like all over the place as well. Like having you noticed, like he's always kind of there in the background lurking, and I just don't. Yeah, know. no, I don't. I don't, I don't trust like anyone it. at this point who's like everywhere like that. You know? Haven't they already Getting taken bad vibes. Storm's End in the um, in the preview chapter? Uh, it's reported secondhand. It, yeah, we 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 didn't see what happened or yeah. know if that's true, but it's reported that suddenly hey, they've got Storm's End too. You know. Like pretty soon they'll just they'll just be in the red keep. Like, jeez, these guys are doing work. Yeah. So I, I have one. I have a hypothetical. Would you rather find someone that looks at you the way that John Con looks at Rigor or the way that homeless Harry looks at elephants? Which would you? Uh, which would you... <laughs> Fuck, that's a good one. Yeah, elephants because uh, John Con is just creepy. Well, I don't know. Harry's kind of creepy too. I don't know how. Don't know. We, 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 don't, we don't see Harry's reaction to that one elephant that comes up with uh, Fagon. I think if, like, you know, he bursts in his pants or something, you know, 
And then we want to be here looking at an analysis. Our answers. <laughs> Connington can look, but he can't touch. Is Harry is, definitely <laughs> is it this chapter, the last one, where he's looking at his arm and he's like, no, I'm fine. I've got like half a year or two or five, like maybe ten. <laughs> now this one he's like, I should chop off my fingers. Oh no, then oh. I have to explain why I'm missing two fingers. <laughs> Hide your fingers. Oh, no. It just goes so quickly from like, I've got a few months to like, I'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, I denial, is, denial is powerful. Yeah. I mean, yeah, how long does it take to, for, like, the stone men to become crazy and all that, really? I don't know. I guess when it gets to your brain, is the, I don't know, how long that takes. Yeah. You got that stone fever. All right. So, so <laughs> speaking of denial, um, my favorite line in this chapter is, but Rhaegar's eyes were dark indigo, darker than this boy's. Um, interpret that as you will. Well, Rhaegar was uh, pure Targaryen, and this boy is uh, Dornish and Targaryen. Do we still think it's fake? Uh, it's a fake Aegon. Oh, yeah, for that? sure. That's what this line would imply. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't. I think it just makes it. I like why well, introduce the Blackfire. I mean, sure, it could just be world building, but I feel like this is the way that they get introduced into the story. Their involvement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and and I think that it doesn't really matter because this guy's not going to be it either way. We're not going to see him as like. Azor high or sitting the throne at the end or anything like that, but I think the most significant part about him is what it means for um, Danny's story and like Illyrio setup and all that. Like what kind of what kind of happened with that? Like if if this was Illyrio's plan all along, sort of thing. So okay, what's motivating so, them in the yeah, wars, yeah. in like during the Wars of the Roses, uh, when. Henry, Henry like, Tudor, Henry. What, yeah, Henry. when Henry Tudor was on the throne after Richard the Third, or, or Richard of York, I mean, uh, there was like a a dude that claimed to be the well, other Richard. Richard yeah, there Crick. there are a couple that were supposed to be the princes in the tower that escaped, but really the they, they don't know what happened to them. But yeah, they figured that they were imposters. So it's like uh, for me with Vagon, it would kind of depend on how you look at that. Like if you think that that was an imposter, or perhaps the real prince. You know, there are no certainly one, no. many imposters popping up in history, in like medieval warfare and stuff. So yeah. I'm sure George is taking inspiration here. Yeah, but I mean, there's like people that were close to that family back then that are like, I don't know, I'm like, I'm not even sure. Yeah, but I mean, this is a Targaryen, so like he has violet eyes and the like silver hair. So I mean, there yeah. are like certain specific tells that would give this one. No, away. that's what I'm saying is like he, the the boy that. Was, his name was like Percival or something or Pate. I don't know. And he, came, he came from France, you know, like it, it could have been, you know, and then when they did that show, I think it was in the show, like was their take on it, which I liked because, you know, you don't know and it would make sense. Yeah, like, the, the, no one in this world has any way of really confirming this shit. I mean, yeah. you know, with the Targaryens, like Daenerys, you can look and go, well, look at the hair and the eyes, and that's sort of what they are, are going to do with him, uh, because that's a fairly a significant feature, have... but that still doesn't prove anything. Yeah, no, because not every Targaryen has the white hair, and everyone knows that. Right, there's no DMV photos, no one has Facebook to be like, that's not the guy. <laughs> not DNA. Like, even 20, 30 years ago, like, in, in our world, like, there were people that were like, wait, who are you? You know, like, they just change their name and get a new social security number, and, like, no one could check up on it. Like, so, More proof yeah, for Duckfield. So... Right it's, there. Per, it's Perkin Warbeck was the imposter. Perkin, yeah. Before Bina lo loses her mind listening to this podcast. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to get a phone call. <laughs> How dare you? Let me just set it straight for you across the pond. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's 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 move on before we like discuss the entire War of the Roses. Um, <laughs> okay. There's a podcast so, out there, right? Didn't so we do that at one point or something? We, that was one of our 
like I think early it was one of the podcasts, first ones. which was yeah. uh, Bino did. Yeah. Still gets still gets comments from. Uh, oh, on on that angry specifically? people, on the War of the Roses, and I think it's yeah, influences on Game of Thrones. Comparing to uh, Ice Fire. That was one of the early VOKs. So after uh, the Griffin Reborn, we jump back six chapters, a hundred pages in the book, to Cersei's first chapter, which is the same same day, basically. Uh, June 14th. So. Okay, Michael? Cersei won. Yes. The nights grow colder as Cersei waits for Jamie. Though she has food, water, and a bed, each hour the scepters come in and ask her to confess to her sins, forcibly waking her if she is asleep. She reflects on the various men who have betrayed her in her eyes and wonders if Jamie has abandoned her as well. As the days progress, Cersei begins to succumb to the effects of her imprisonment and realizes she must confess and be with Tommen. She is taken to the High Septon, where she confesses to betting Lancel and all three Kettleblack brothers, but denies responsibility for the murders of King Robert, the former High Septon, the framing of Marjorie Tyrell, as well as denying her incestuous relationship with Jaime. For the crimes that she has denied, Cersei will trace face a trial by faith, but is permitted a more room for her confessions. The next day, she is visited by Kevin, who brings hard tidings. Jamie has vanished in the Riverlands. Cell swords are landing in the Stormlands, presumably in the service of Stannis. Mace Tyrell has made, been made Hand of the King, and although he possesses the strength to deal with this invasion, he refuses to move against them until Marjorie is proven innocent. Cersei is accused of diocide, regicide, and incest, and will be executed should she be found guilty. If she wishes to leave the Sept of Baelor, she must additionally make a walk of atonement for her sins. Finally, Balon Swan has sent news from Dawn, telling of Marcella's maiming and the death of Eris Okart. Cersei seizes on the death of Eris, as a new member of the Kingsguard must now be installed. Fearing being overheard, Cersei instructs Kevin to bring a white cloak to Kyburn and simply to tell him that the time has come. So this is Cersei in A Dance with Dragons. Never has the death of a Kingsguard been, like, so well-received. Yes, yeah, so she's like, Finally, oh. someone's died. And I, and I like all of the, just the before... early scenes of torture in this where they're just, like, they won't let her sleep. Which, like, know, that's an effective for... form of torture. It is. And, and sleep deprivation and... is terrible. And yeah, unlike what really like, well Kyburn has done to the Blue Bard, where like you can see he's missing an eye and stuff, you know, the 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 Faith can be like, oh no, we're we're keeping Cersei in a nice cell, she's fine, and she's clearly losing her mind. No bruises, you know. Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's great because in 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 some ways, as the reader, you're like, oh yeah, Cersei deserves this shit, but it's I mean, it's also it's pretty terrible to do that to anyone, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is I I don't know if anyone really feels like fully sympathetic for Cersei here, but it really is a great, you know, case study as a writer of like how you make how you like kind of role reverse when you make her the POV and you show all the bad shit happening to her and how she's, you know, she's, you know, obviously Cersei is a bad person, but so is the High Septon, you know, (laughs) he's also an asshole and the faith itself is, you know, kind of a fucked up institution. And you see her feeling the brunt of that. And you kind of do. I kind of do feel bad for her, you know, that she's being tortured. It's not nice. I don't. <laughs> I don't feel bad for her at all. But I do feel uh, <laughs> concerned about, like, what the fuck's going Why would a church have cells? Like, there's your first clue. Uh, I just, like, what So the there's the a thing called the Inquisition? And that had lots of torture cells, and yeah, all, I just, basically all I mean, over like, Europe. It's just insane. Nobody expected the I faith mean. militant. It's like <laughs> it's like having a smoking lounge in a hospital. You just don't <laughs> like the two don't go together. Well, maybe these are makeshift the cells. <laughs> I actually think it's kind of impressive how Cersei, and it, it actually kind of speaks to her just like overwhelming hatred and, and willingness to vent herself on anyone who does her wrong. But the fact that she doesn't like fully break through all of this is kind of impressive in terms of just how, you know, how strong that feeling of like, I will not let them see my tears, all this kind of stuff. Like she is just like so prideful and so unwilling to 
to do that and it's all it's all an act still through all this like any contrition she yeah. has is all fake it's it's she you is really hateful one of the best parts one of the best parts of the chapter is when she just sort of like she's being tortured and she's just comes to the realization well i just need to confess and she like puts on the act it's like i'm ready to confess and they just leave her alone and she sleeps for the night you know but then of course you know she doesn't intend to to actually do anything but confess to what they already know yeah, she's it's, very smart in taking taking the the things she knows she can't deny, and obviously not confessing to the things that are going to get her killed. If you were in her position, would you do the walk of shame? I've done the walk of shame many a time. <laughs> I, I, I ain't ashamed. Uh, yeah, yeah if, if, if you're just a normal person, you can walk through the streets buck naked, like, and people would just laugh and not care, but as the queen or she views herself as the queen, like that's the, the power base that she's wanting to establish is going to be significantly compromised by the way. I, I, yeah. I and I also think it's kind of like a dumbass move on their part too, because they're it. It's like just with anything else that's Royal, you know, when you undercut the sovereignty, you undercut the whole reasoning behind like why the hell your entire life is the way it is. You know what I mean? Like they're right, but they want people to, to they want people to believe in the faith. Like they're trying to usurp the, the crown anyway. But the faith but the faith only has like power and autonomy and influence over the masses from temporarily the crown. You know but, but no, they right. view that's that their mandate change. comes from the seven. So that's I mean this is how in history this is how this sort of thing has worked before. You know, so they view that you know their their mandate comes from God, and they get enough power and enough freedom to expand their power from the local government, and they use that to essentially become the power, you know, which I, I think is probably their goal. In terms of Cersei's you know character and her choice to to do the walk, it's funny, right? Because it seems kind of antithetical to who she is. You know, I just talked about how prideful she is, and she would never be willing to you know like show herself like that that openly like that and, you know, debase herself in that way. But I almost feel like Cersei is so prideful that she do- just, like, doesn't care. She just, like, doesn't care what, what people think of her. She doesn't care if they see her like 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 that. It's such, it, it goes to such a degree like that that it doesn't actually matter to her. She can, like, still be prideful. She Her, her self-esteem is not damaged in any way by that experience. Well, you don't think so? I mean, in her next POV, I think, I think so, she yeah. breaks well, completely. It, it, well, temporarily, but I am assume that she'll recover. <laughs> oh, I think she's all fucked up. I don't think so. I think she'll be fine. She oh, certainly I mean, thinks at the start of the walk, you know, this will not break me. They think it will, but I'm going to be above that. Um, and yeah. by the end, she's hallucinating faces. and. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, she, yeah, yeah, she may fall apart she, in that moment. She's but a giant I, zombie. Yeah, but that's like, like when I'm you all jump good now. across like a big chasm and you're like, I'm gonna make it. I got it. I'm, I'm gonna fucking make it. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> that's you just she's just psyching herself up, but she's all she's screwed up. That's just I, messed up. I, well, yeah, she's messed up, obviously, but I think she I think her pride will be intact moving forward. I think this was a very temporary or will be a very temporary uh blow to you that. See, you see, I think like uh the the last chapter in dance shows her like completely broken and humbled. So it'd be interesting to see what her first POV and wins is going to be like, whether she is broken or she still has that Lannister pride. Cause I mean, if she didn't learn anything from this whole experience, then that's just shitty writing. If I don't think so. The way she <laughs> acts in this chapter where she's acting all humble and oh, I have sinned. I need to atone. I think that's very applicable to the epilogue chapter where she's also putting on a front um, and I think she will grow or change as a character and that she's going to be like messed up um, and her perception of reality will be changed. But just her pride is still there. Yeah, she may be more, you know, more delusional, more hateful and just more twisted. But I don't think that she's humbled. And I don't think that's bad writing. I, I you know, there there people don't necessarily change, you know, like they can go through a dramatic experience like this. and It doesn't necessarily have to change them. I don't think that that makes it a, a static character, like a bad character or a poorly constructed character. Some people are just who they are. No, no, that's true. I mean, I thought she was all fucked up before, and I just think she's like double and triple fucked up now. That's all. Fair enough. Oh, she's definitely I, fucked up. I'm not like, okay, that. here's the thing. <laughs> I just think this whole thing is stupid. Like, 
it, it's just such a frustrating shit show because there's no good way this can play out. You cannot do that to a royal person and not have at least a good percentage of the small folks saying like, oh, well, she's just like us. So they're all just like us. So let's go burn that mother down. You know what I mean? Like that it can escalate so quickly. It's just not worth it at all. I mean, yes. But is that I'm exactly the sentiment that the, the high sparrow and the sparrows are trying to, to, to engender? They're trying to create that effect where people realize that they're actually. Is, yeah, bad for the monarchy, really but uh, good for the theocracy. Down one institution to taking down the, the next one. Well, no, because, you know, like, um, I don't, I forget who was saying it earlier, but basically the, the belief of the faith is that, you know, the mandate to rule is conferred upon the monarchy by their gods. And if they're, they are unworthy, then perhaps the only thing that has, you know, significance or a mandate to rule are the people who serve the gods directly. And the, the gods themselves are the only thing that are worthy of our Right. Respect. And what's, what's easier to manipulate the people, the belief that, like, you serve people that are just great because of the way they were born and you, you need to serve them or that I'm in touch with the person that created or the people that created this world and we give them the power and we, you know, it's something that they can relate of because it makes the people feel like they're a part of it. That's what I'm saying. It's like, it's like in ancient Egypt, you know, it's, they're the ruler, but they are also God. Like any Royal person is, ordained by God or in this case the seven of them so when you start undercutting that you're really starting to cut yourself off at your own heel it's right well but I, I think their, their, their implication here is, would be that like look these people are corrupt and God has chosen the gods have chosen someone to replace them so the thing. gods like were this, wrong so well, they're I don't, I, they're I don't wrong think, I don't think, well, I mean, that's obviously not how common people think, especially people that can't read and all that. But I don't think they have the same sort of doctrine that we have. And that's kind of a fairly new doctrine anyway, if you're thinking about like Christianity and stuff that like all leaders are appointed by God. That's not, doesn't seem to be the system of the seven. I, I'd say it, it still actually does fit. Thing and it's not a Christian thing. Yeah, it, it's not. And I think it is actually what, what is being portrayed here. But I think you're right. Adam, that there could be a case where you know it's very it's all about spin right it's about how the the people of the the people that represent the faith spin how you know this this poor frail weak human erred even though they were ordained by god 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 or gods have taken back that privilege from them and we need to find someone who is actually truly I mean, faithful and good he was never ordained by them but but do you see what i'm saying though it's like oh yeah and i think it could easily backfire right yeah if the, it's totally untenable for them to be doing this it's just it's not a risk. oh yeah I, I don't think they've i don't think they've increased their their force enough to make this work in the end i don't think it will work but the only thing that i could see this like going the right way for them is if then they say well it's because these are false kings and queens they should have never been on the throne so we need to find a targaryen right. or well a targaryen or you know whoever they pick i don't know if you know if uh someone fagon happens to show up at the right moment like maybe that's where this goes where they're like yeah. aha the true king has returned but you know i don't know that can't be in their mind at the moment so they would probably just and, like, pick whoever they can manipulate following a targaryen under those circumstances but otherwise it's like how how is anyone going to take this shit seriously anymore you guys you know what i mean like they're all well, airing the their dirty they're, they're shaming Cersei, who was the queen mother, and not, you know, Tommen, who was their actual king. You know, Cersei is disposable, dispensable um, in that right. sense. Um, she is the evil counselor that needs to be discarded. So they're not necessarily going after the institution of the monarchy um, as if they went directly for Tommen. That, that's a fair point because one of the, the best things about Cersei chapters are being in her head and how crazy she is and how attached she's getting and like how you know she believes the things going on around her don't don't quite line up. So like we view her as kind of Queen Cersei because that's what she's been, but less and less I think the people look at her that way and maybe they never the common people never really looked at her with that much power in the first place. It, it was always Robert, and it hasn't been that long since all that's gone down. 
Um, mm-hmm. Then her power was der- derived through t- um, Joffrey and now Tommen, obviously. She's done a lot of stuff behind the scenes that, you know, she's not putting out in the newspaper, right? Because it's not the kind of stuff that you know, she wants people to know she did. So, Yeah, that's a good point. I just, I don't know, the whole thing to me, it always felt like they're just rapidly heading, barreling toward a cliff, like... You know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, and then oh, you're just a regular fucking dude. Oh, oh, definitely, yeah, it's definitely you know? a, a dangerous play. And like I said, I don't think it'll work out for them. Um, I think it's going to end badly for everyone in this situation. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, well King's the other Landing. Thing is so crazy, yeah. like you don't know what she'll do next. You know, like. Well, but in this chapter, they specifically have a dragon say that <laughs> Cersei, your end is at, at a rule. Your rule is at an end. So they're, they're going on the assumption that she's not going to be doing any more ruling, which, unfortunately, Kevin takes a crossbow right. to the bowels. And so by yeah. very uh, slim chance, Cersei's back in power, Whoops. most likely. Oops, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think so, because Mace Tyrell is pretty firmly in hand of the king and wants to appoint his own people. I think he'll act quickly. Like, I think he's astute enough to realize that when Kevin's gone, he's got to put in someone like um, like Tarly or someone, you know, one of his guys into that position. Yeah. I think Sometimes I forget well, that Mace Tyrell is not show Mace Tyrell and can right. actually do things. Oh, he's still a buffoon <laughs> in the books. Yeah. Well, but but he's he's, he's not as bad as his less, dad. He's less as bad as, as on the show. So like, it's possible that he gets something done. But Cersei also moves really quickly and knows a lot of people in King's Landing. So, I mean, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Well, I think especially with that... whatever Varys is going to do. It's yeah. obviously a consistent theme throughout the series, and it's something that I think occurs in all these chapters. You know, of course, in the case of the Tyrion chapter, Tyrion at least is you know somewhat of a not well. Tyrion and Jor are you know kind of on their path, but then that goes wrong just because of a storm and the balance of power shifts, and they're they're slaves now. Uh, in John Con's case, he even remarks on the fact that like he was just an exile you know a minute ago, but now he's a lord again. Uh, just the idea that the balance of power and that the uh, dynamics of power and who's in control can shift immediately that is definitely something that can that can occur and i think you know, right it's until things settle like it, nothing's final that's why like when in the last chapter you know connington giving his speech about you know the lord has returned and follow me and i i, I reading that i was thinking you know about the his you know his vassals there it's like to them, it's like, okay, I guess, you know, this is the new regime. They just kind of go with it because what, what else are they going to do? But then six months, a year, a few weeks, whatever, down the line, things go badly. Are they all getting executed or are they, you know, hopefully the new Lord is just like, all right, I'm keeping the staff on, you know? <laughs> oh, um, who do you think they will get to replace Kevin? Do you think it will be Randall Tarley? Um, well, either that or one of his sons. Cersei is still the queen regent, so he, uh, Kevin was the lord regent that had assumed power, so I'm assuming Cersei goes right back into that spot as technically on top. But he, he's the hand, though, too, right? He's made Mace Tyrell the hand now. Oh, okay. Yeah, because Mace wants a ridiculous chair. <laughs> it's shaped like a hand. Yeah, and and all of it is about... I think all of it is about where people are in the immediacy. Like, even if someone like, the, you know, the Tarleys or someone has more power or can, you know, muster more power, like whoever's in the Red Keep and can kind of start sending out ravens and get people on their side, you know, you don't need a lot of people to manage the Red Keep, right? Like, it's not like you need a whole host of armies like you do to run the city. It's like uh, possession is nine tenths of the law, sort of thing. So. Mm-hmm. I still it's, think the Tarleys are in cahoots with Aegon and John Khan. I think that that's the I'd, li- I'd like that. I'd like that's that. the friends in the Reach or whatever. Yeah, that they're yeah I think it's them, but we'll yeah. see. Obviously, it could be a lot of people. Huh. Yeah. Well, I was just gonna say, I think it would be interesting if like Doran Martell came to court. I think Doran is stuck in Dorn because he's in his wheelchair. Right. Aren't we'll we, see other Martells. Yeah, we'll see other Martells and the Bastards coming to King's Landing in court, but not Doran, I don't think. Yeah, I do think the Martells are, are going to play significantly over the next book or so. Um, so I, especially because of how much they talk about how Doran, you know, is, is weak and he won't do anything. And, now and then we see he's actually been plotting. With John Con and all that shit, right? Or no? 
they want to be uh, John Con wants to uh, to send secret messages to Doran, and then from the preview chapters we know that uh, they've been in it together all along, thing. though, right? Like they sent no, Ariane to go treat with them. Ariane, yeah, yeah. But that's not message, part of his whole deal. The message like, Doran receives when, is when he like smacks her upside the head. He's like, dude, this shit's been going on like before you were even born. So just stop, like. I don't. I couldn't even begin to explain it to you. you just well, the original. Me. The original plan was to to go with uh, Viserys, um, Daenerys. and then Daenerys, and and now it's going to be with uh, Aegon. It seems. Yeah. So is that why everyone thinks it's a Fagon then? Well, there's many many reasons why people think Aegon might be a fake. Um, getting into all of them could be, is is a lot, but. <laughs> Because I just, I always read it as like, that's what he was talking about. Because in one of the Winds of Winter chapters, uh, they received a letter from John Connington. And it's like, I did not die, nor did Aegon. Like, these things are a revelation. And Doran is reacting as if this is a revelation. Where he's like, I would weep for joy if I knew some part of Elia had survived. So it very much reads like Aegon was, not, no one was anticipating Aegon as yeah. Varys intended. Yeah, and it makes a ton no of sense for Doran. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it makes a ton of sense for Doran to go with them, especially when they find out what happened to Quentin. Like it just makes total sense Agreed. to go that way. Quentin lives. Twenty twenty. He doesn't though. But he does. But but he could. And Jay Westerling the hips and he's fine. Shut he's up. Right. And we he's could get wins. A bit. He's totally fine. That's the greatest of all. Hopes. What was the so? What was the latest uh, George announcement like a week or two ago? Where he said that like after wins, he's writing Wild the next cards. Duncan Ed book before uh, before he gets to Dream of Spring, which is probably uh, a good no, idea. He's uh, writing the second half of Fire and Blood after wins. No, and that's then, coming uh, out. Uh, that would so, be after. Oh, I mean, I don't he? believe him, but that's what he said. Yeah, that's what he said. No, he yeah. said the next book he publishes in the series is going to be Wins. Yeah, he said yeah. Wins, then Duncan Egg, then Dream, then then uh, Fire and Blood. Then Birds. Fire and Blood. How about Wins, I, yeah. and, yeah. Dream, and then everything else? <laughs> I want Fire and Blood Part 2 towards the I end. Want, well, I want to have... I, <laughs> yeah. We had a whole <laughs> thing on like Wild a Cards a few episodes ago. But... <laughs> Eating the Beast uh, book. So he, he's at Worldcon this weekend, so hopefully we'll get some kind of announcement or something. Oh, is that this weekend? Yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. Is that yeah. is that in San Francisco? That's in Ireland. That's in, yeah. We're at it's like Defcon, Defcon 1 over here. This isn't the Worldcon where like everyone's like, oh, he's going to trap himself in a cabin if it's not done. That's next That's year. next year, right? Okay, okay, good. Which I thought, it's that's still be nothing, to be clear. <laughs> that's in New Zealand or something next year, right? That's right. Yeah, okay. I was like, holy crap, it came up quick. Is he in any danger of reading an excerpt there, or no? I don't know. I mean, he he has a speaking thing. I think they're inducting him into some kind of fucking Hall of Fame for taking his sweet-ass time, and, uh... <laughs> they're... Um, let's see, what does not a blog say? Oh, He's already given us, like, cards. 20 chapters, Shocking. so... Uh... <laughs> I feel like yeah, the there's a good chance that he rereads something off. he's already read, you know. So. <laughs> Fucking football season's coming up, so we're definitely screwed till at least February. Oh yeah, he's not going to write anything. Oh, oh, especially with how bad the Giants are going to be this year. Oh, what are you cool. talking about? Daniel Jones is the Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see he was five for five on his first drive? No, I did not see that. He's, I just can't wait to see if Antonio Brown gets his helmet. This oh, is the entry that that's gets paid. Really like. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! Now I'm sorry I brought it up. Sorry. Yeah. Well, sorry. oh yeah. Don't 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 uh, look up Antonio Brown's recent comment about his feet. Then <laughs> you'll be okay. really oh, sorry. No. I so just, I, had, uh, I hate 30, football uh, so much. I would rather never have wins than ever hear anything about fucking football again. Um, so 6.30 time is when his uh, conversation with Maura McHugh in Dublin starts. So maybe check back uh, tonight, check the interwebs, and see what people are putting up. 
your is I'm not 17th saying, for anyone who's... I'm not saying we're getting a publication date for wins, but I'm just saying check back. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's aliens, but aliens. <laughs> uh, all right. Tide right. comes in, Tide goes up. And on, on that note, that. Um, do we have anything else about Cersei and Kevin? Nothing else. Uh, I have some Jamie's lost some in the Riverlands. So when Cersei reacts to hearing that Marcella has lost an ear, uh, she's basically like, oh, she had such a pretty face. Um, yeah, now, I'm not a parent. Right, right. Yeah, I'm not a parent. But yeah, no. I, I, I think if my child had been maimed horribly, I would be a bit more concerned. I'd be like, oh, my God. I, I just think this contributes to evidence that Marcella and Tommen were sort of sidelined while Joffrey got, like, all the corrupting influence yeah, and attention. It, yeah, mm. because, like, one of the things, like, early on in the books is, like, the only thing that makes Cersei human is, like, her love for her children. And this was totally, like, oh, she had a pretty face. Like, what kind of crazy... <laughs> that's, like, you know... She's like, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> like, come on, I actually I don't think it's bad. Pageant. Oh no! I actually don't well, think it's that it, bad. Yeah, maybe maybe it is just like um, a miss. Like she does care. I do get the sense she does genuinely care for Marcella, but it just seemed like a, a strange reaction. Uh, it might just be the first reaction, like uh, like that's the first thing, <laughs> which might be people, bad on its own. The first thing she, she thinks of. If it was someone else, I might be like, "Well, this isn't so bad," because I've known people that have you know had hardships with their children, and I think about my son. Like there, I mean, that thought is maybe not too far from your mind. If something like that happens, like, oh my gosh, you know, you know, poor kid, he was, you know, he was such a cute kid or something. You might, you might think of it in that yeah. way. But once you know they're safe and everything's, you know, I don't know. Um, there's still less, a lot less of charitable problems. with Cersei. I understand. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. With, that, with Cersei, it's sort of like, oh, I don't think she cares about the other stuff quite so much. I think in the epilogue too, like Kevin tells her something, and her first reaction is Tyrion. Tyrion did it. Like. She always Tyrion. <laughs> it reminds me of like the night at the Roxbury where the guy's like, "Did you grab my ass?" And he's like, "Sir, I'm down the street." Like he's on the cell phone. He's like, "I couldn't Dude, possibly sir, have I'm done that." across the room, room. you can see my hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's just like Tyrion. Tyrion did everything. They're like, I don't think Tyrion could have done this, but we'll investigate. <laughs> <laughs> everything is Tyrion. Like, he has become, like, a snark or grumpkin to her. Like, he's just lurking behind every shadow. Well, the great thing is it's true for Tyrion as well. It's like this, like, twin. Like, they're haunting each other. It's so it's so twisted. They're going full Kylo Ren and Rey. <laughs> yeah. Mind melts. No, I don't, I don't think she did. I'm going to see just Tyrion shirtless. Their own, <laughs> they're just connecting within their own mind prisons. <laughs> Yeah, she's she like, is really is flippant Tyrion's about it. Belt she's like, so mm. high on his waist. She's like, oh, her face is Tyrion's much chest. Wow. Shame, but I've got bigger problems over here. Like maybe it could be that because she's just like not really in a position to do much about it. So like, what would freaking out help anybody? I loved she her reaction does. like a while back to the like the the when they brought the the dwarf head or whatever. And she was like, ah, this obviously isn't him, but I don't want to, like, be too harsh and then no one brings me more dwarf heads because I don't really care about the dwarf heads. But I, I obviously can't, like, reward them for this. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> She's like, I have to still maintain some incentive for future murders that hopefully will be Tyrion while punishing these people. <laughs> Do you think that her concern is more like, Oh well, she was pretty, and now I won't be able to like marry her off to my advantage. I think if anything, it just speaks to the way that you know you think of what just a woman in the society, like that 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 being her like prime virtue as a person. Well, yeah, I think she views herself through her kids a little bit, you know, like especially Marcella, because that's the only the only girl. I don't even know if she'd really want to be marrying her off necessarily. Um, like she didn't want to be married off. I think she probably be pretty resistant to the idea yeah I guess that's true but that would mean that she actually cares about Marcella more than she cares about herself which I don't think is the case well no but I, I think that's that comes back to like you know living vicariously through your children where like if she had the power to decide whether or not Marcella can get married off 
and that situation were to come up, you know, Marcella didn't want to get married off. She's like, well, I didn't want to be married off either, so I'm not going to let that happen to my daughter kind of thing. Like, you know, correcting her own past through her child instead of actually caring about Marcella. That shit makes me so sad. Like, when Ariane does all that, it's like, oh, man, if you... If only you could just, like, talk to Cersei about it. I bet you she'd be into it. You know what I mean? Like, because she just so desperately wants to be the queen. And that's, like, a chance to live vicariously that way through Marcella. I feel like they're on the same page. They're just... They don't know. Yeah, that whole that whole plot is ill-conceived. And, um, no, I think it went well. Someone tell <laughs> It went it's okay. Really, it's really all about that. That's Barry's part. It <laughs> works out for Cersei. So when uh, Cersei is being questioned by the High Septon, I, something I thought was very presumptuous is when they then ask, oh, and by the way, are your kids incest babies? Because that was just... <laughs> all the other things come from what Lancel and the Kettleblacks have confessed, but this one is just like, oh, and there's some rumors going round. I, there I were ravens very, sent out. Yeah, it's very it, it's very hypocritical, right? Because they they point out that Stannis is obviously a godless heathen, um, but he is the one who spread the rumor. So it's like, why? Well, you got to pick your line here, guys. Like, which do you believe? <laughs> They're a religion. They don't really have to do that. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> it's it's obviously expected, but it is very hypocritical. And and I mean, let's be honest, they are incest babies. It's pretty obvious. <laughs> 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 like in passing oh by the way any chance you fucked your brother resulting in these three children <laughs> can I interest you in confessing to this abomination <laughs> no next item <laughs> yeah like I just I don't know and and so I, I did the, the Cersei ch- I read the other chapters in the Cersei chapter I was like uh, I was like in a hurry I, I had a flat tire so I had to get the car fixed and so I was like, I, I'll do the Dotri, so I'll, I'll listen to it. And, like, he does the High Septon. Like, I don't think he did this in the previous books, but he does his, like, Tyrion Leprechaun voice. <laughs> like, wait, what What just happened? This is not the version of the High Septon that uh, is in my head or that I thought you did in the previous books. So. <laughs> What's that? Roy Dotrice did a bad voice? Never. Oh. Not no more, he don't. Con- confess it Rest to your kind, peace, Cersei. I liked your voices, Roy. <laughs> Uh, R.I.P. Roy. Anyone who speaks uh, badly of Roy, shame on you. I mean, just, you know, oh. you're right, but I'm just gonna pop in and hey, say Abby. hi, just because I've been lurking here for like five minutes, waiting for a lull, and I feel kind of awkward doing that. So, <laughs> oh, hey, Abby. <laughs> hi, I got off of work a little early, so I am here now. Nice. Are you? But you guys seem to be finishing up, Cersei. Right? That's the last chapter. Yeah, we're just we're just about wrapping up. So, do you have any thoughts on um, any of the chapters you want to throw out? Yeah, anything you want to throw at us? Uh, not really. <laughs> Good contribution. Glad to have I you am. on. <laughs> Glad you could solid be. work. I just I don't know. <laughs> I thought maybe I would I'll be able just, to like, join. Add jock to the title too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I might be able to like jump in and then like pick up on what you guys are talking about and be like, oh yes, my opinion on that topic. But I will ask what's not to happen. Sadly, we we went through these chapters pretty quickly. I mean, I think we were basically done about twenty minutes ago. Like this will oh, wow. cut down to less to less than an hour. Um, oh, like wow. the first two chapters were not, you know. Hmm. Yeah. What do you think about Fagon? Real or fakesies? Oh my god, I don't even have like an opinion on that just because he's so. I just don't even like. I just don't care enough about that whole <laughs> plot that I don't have a. Fair like, enough. I, I don't care if he's real. I don't really care if he's fake. You um, know, it's gonna go nowhere regardless. So like, like it could go somewhere, and like maybe it'll be interesting. But I don't really understand why everyone is so obsessed with John Connington. Like I'm just like We've I don't really. About that. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. Um, I don't know. I do know that I. I didn't read the chapters because I knew I wasn't going to be able to join the whole call. But I just know that I hate all of Tyrion's dance chapters a lot. Um, we talked about that too. Yep. <laughs> yep. You're right on so, sync with us. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Simpatico here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Is this the Tyrion so one where is they... that a llama in your picture? Yeah, it's me with a llama when I'm like that's, 13. <laughs> that's that's crazy. Okay. My overnight camp had a llama, and I took a picture with it. 
Oh. I like Tyrion's dance chapters. I like the end of. I like his dance chapters. Um, when he's with, uh, frick, what's the the yellow whale guy? Yezin. Yeah, the yeah. I so I like his like last two I think, but otherwise I really don't right. care where, for that. Where you feel he's cl- where you feel like he's closer to being part of the plot again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's also cleaning up a ton of shit. I mean, I think I think what was the first thing we said about Tyrion's chapter that like you probably just could have cut it all out. So. <laughs> I yeah. like I like his dynamic with Penny though. Oh, I do I, not care oh, about yeah. her at all. I I like that she has a pig and a dog, and I think it's really cute. <laughs> and like no, that's I mean, about it. <laughs> not 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 like uh, them like doing anything. I I just like the perspective that he gets from her. Like he's always brooding and like my life is a piece of shit, and everyone hates me. And then with Penny, it's like, well, it could be worse. Too. Yeah, but I feel like we've had that with so many other characters that it's just like so. And it, I feel like this one is so on the nose where it's like Tyrion doesn't realize how bad he's had it, you know, or like how yeah, good he's we had said it. That too. Oh <laughs> fair point. Yeah, Abby, you're syncing with us like perfectly. <laughs> you were amazing. just like you could just you were you in. on this podcast the whole time? Yeah, I was get- <laughs> <laughs> you can just put me in when you guys are talking about this. <laughs> I could. <laughs> I could edit these bits way back. <laughs> That's so much <laughs> it would be, effort. It would, be, it would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, or I'll just put it in the after show. It's much easier. But yeah, I guess but, she like kind of helps advance the plot enough where I can't like hate her. But there probably could have been much easier ways. Actually, no. Does she help advance the plot at all? Not really. No, it's Jorah. It's all Jorah. Never mind. She doesn't do anything. <laughs> Her assassination <laughs> attempt of Tyrion gets them on the ship to Marine. Oh. So if you, okay. if that counts. That yeah. counts. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, works. Yeah. And she'll try again later. <laughs> <laughs> and Jorah needs to die. Jorah. Jorah needs to die. Yeah. Creepy, creepy old hairy dude that like is obsessed with a thirteen-year-old. So. Yeah. Not a fun time. Hey, hey, Daenerys is like sixteen now. That's that's much more acceptable. She's like, well, no, she's like maybe fifteen. Is right? he really that old though? Isn't he in like in his thirties? No, no, he's it, not. He's not Ian Glenn. Um, he's like, he, no, he, yeah, he doesn't need to be super old or anything. Like, if he's like twenty five, it's still creepy. Yeah, but, like, he's he's old. He's like, yeah, he's he's old. Like, it'd be creepy significantly as, older than yeah. her. If if I a twenty year old was dating a sixteen year old, that'd be creepy. But only in these. Not times. in their world. Yeah, like. <laughs> in their world, it's it's basically like if uh, for women, if you're outside of your teens, and you're not already betrothed, you're probably just done. Like they're well, like, oh, she's crazy. an old maid at twenty one, you know. Well, because so, they yeah. only have they only have childhood and adulthood. There's no intermediate years. So right. And childhood yeah. ends at like as soon as the first famine or like at twelve. Hey, hey Bran's almost a man grown when he's like eight. So <laughs> I I, yeah, I don't really know how, in, how they decide when men are adults, but I know it's like women. It's like when they have their first period or something. I don't know what they right. decide when how men. Which is terrible way to. <laughs> yeah, when you get hair on your chest, which I guess for Mormont was probably at like nine. <laughs> no, I think it's it's <laughs> definitely the testicles because some people don't get chest hair. But yeah, even with the society's expectations, this is, this is creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Let us pass when it is not creepy. <laughs> Can you just title this test? The point test, is, the like, point is, it's is all that, about testicles. The point is, is that Jorah is done. I mean, like his utility <laughs> for the plot, I think, is just about done, and I'm, I'm sure they'll keep him around longer. But uh, like, I think he could, he could go. Yeah, I oh my god, I'm so over him. <laughs> like, he'll, he'll help Tyrion get to a audience with Danny, and then I think after that, he's not. There's nothing you can do with him really anymore because. Well, in the pre- in the preview chapter, he seems to get signs of life there. Oh, okay. I haven't read the preview chapter, so I have no idea. I don't care about spoilers. I'm just I haven't read it, so. Well, it doesn't really spoil anything. He just kills a dude. Oh, I feel like okay. he turned into a bear. <laughs> then Gandalf showed up. 
I can't wait for a dream of spring when, like, you know, wizards with pointy hats are just everywhere. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, where did they come from? Shit's just what, exploding. West of Westeros. Yeah. <laughs> Bloodying out of the citadel. Just... <laughs> They're the, that's what the high tower is. It's just the wizard school. Yeah, it's actually Hogwarts is like Yeah. We've sea been monsters waiting. climbing out of the sea and just destroying everything. Yeah. I do oh, Raven has cracking. arrived. You've been accepted <laughs> to the King's Landing School of Dark Mages and Wizardry. You're a maester, Harry. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ. Would that make Hagrid like Kyburn? Because he got like kicked out of the... <laughs> oh, I, just, I like it. He, he, uh, he, he keeps maybe his... like Holden Halfmaester? Yeah, he keeps his links in his umbrella. <laughs> yeah, all right, all right. We're, uh, I think Very we're tough. done. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm glad I could um... contribute so much. Yeah. Hey, this was fun. That was the best so... part of the whole cast, actually. <laughs> How dare you? So, thank you guys for joining me. That was a lot of fun. Uh, quick chapters, I know, you know, not the most exciting stuff, but uh, we get uh, some good chapters next week, <laughs> our next episode, which uh, I believe Bina will be hosting. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, Theon Four, which is the Prince of Winterfell, uh, the King's Prize, which is Asha's second chapter, and uh, the Walk of Shame, Cersei's second chapter. So, these are, you know, that's actually a nice... Uh, a nice set of chapters should have signed up for those. All right. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thanks Bye-bye. everyone. Cheers. I don't know if you want me to sign off or not. Cause I don't know if I'm going to appear at all. So. Just I hope high. you do. I hope you do. <laughs> That's right. my hope. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and interesting Abby. Goodbye Abby. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye Abby. <laughs> Yeah. I hope you do and get someone spliced asked, here randomly. Someone ask George what a fucking Morlocks maze is. Zach failed us. I missed my chance. <laughs> God damn it. And you know who else failed us? Greg. Yeah. Yep. He did. Like when always. He, but I did get a signed he, copy of Game of Thrones, so he did not I fail did me. I did too, which was great. But he, he he got all those damn books signed, and they were like, don't ask about... Don't ask about anything. Like he'll talk to you about wild cards, but don't ask about, you know, the books or what, how he's writing. You know, you just leave him alone. And I'm like, the perfect thing would have been like, so hey, that warlock's maze, by the way. Like, you got anything on that? If you would not remember that, you would have no it's, idea. He'd be like, was there? Um, did I? Is that in my book or was that in wild cards? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't remember a warlock's maze. Um, it was a just, team pilot that got like, rejected. I'm hoping that, like, there's some story behind it where it's, like, something from his youth, and he was like, oh, yeah, the Warlock's Maze, you know. (laughs) (laughs) So the Warlock's Maze, it's made of hedges. It starts off made of hedges, but as you get closer, it's it's made of trees. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, yeah. I don't need that kind of detail. I'm just just curious where he came up with it. (laughs) Oh, Warlock's Maze. Oh, all right, guys.